So I'd like to uh, provide an update on a wonderful KDigo conference that was in Barcelona last year this time, and it was, uh, it was, it was really fun. We were, uh, Tim Goodship and I were asked early in, in 2015 if we would organize something like this, and so we both jumped at the opportunity, and then they asked us where we would like to have it. And so I, and my wife always wanted to go to Barcelona, so I said, Barcelona! <laughs> and, and they said, okay. <laughs> and so it's great. And so we got to go to Barcelona. And, and, uh, and so um, I know Linda was there as a patient representative. Uh, my wife was there as a patient representative. There was some people from England as patient representatives from Italy. And then there were about uh, 60 scientists and they were divided into five different teams and so Carla led the uh, treatment team and the idea was to focus on atypical HUS and C3G so that, that's its kissing cousin another complement mediated renal disease and to define or identify areas that are problematic to clinicians and scientists today. And so, for example, we've heard that in the Netherlands, after transplantation, eculizumab wasn't used, and, uh, and 13 patients did really well, or, uh, 12 out of 13. And, and, and so on the face of that, that seems to be very, very encouraging but unless in all of those patients we have all of the genetic data and all of the complement data and the antecedent historical data that leads to renal impairment, it's difficult to actually it's difficult to actually extract the precise value of that information. And and so that gets to what Christy was saying, where on each of these cases and each for each person we need lots and lots of information to be able to make robust conclusions so consider for example the renal pathology there are challenges so this was one of the points from the Kedigo conference there are challenges with nomenclature and whether to use the term TMA thrombotic microangiopathy recommending rec recognizing that thrombosis isn't necessarily a part of it and so the name itself can be misleading. And recognizing that you can have active and chronic microangiopathy, and for example, in chronic microangiopathy, a driver of disease can be hypertension, and so antecedent hypertension can in some patients uh, uh, give them the presentation of atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So you might present with something, but the driver that resulted in that presentation wasn't necessarily complement driven or complement based. And so one of the recommendations was to be, in, in, in looking at the biopsy, was to see whether the renal pathologist could provide information as to possible underlying causes, whether it's shigatoxin-associated HUS, whether it's TTP-associated, or whether in some cases it's associated with malignant hypertension. That would make the biopsy more helpful, more useful, and uh, in, in, in addition, they thought that it was doubtful that staining for C5B9, so that soluble uh, membrane attack complex, or staining for MAC, is useful. The knowledge gaps were that there are a significant number of biopsies show a microangiopathy picture with some degree of activity, and the relationship of that picture to complement dysregulation is not currently known. So again, we're getting back to the, the, uh, the theme that in many patients, in many persons, our understanding 
of what's actually happening is incomplete. Again, it's like that puzzle, pic and, it's, and we haven't turned over enough picture, pieces of that puzzle to generate a valuable picture to allow us to extract from one patient and draw conclusions about a second patient or a third patient. In the areas of patient management, this is their rendition of Carla's Peacock, where we have lots of potential interactors with complement-mediated atypical HUS, and we really don't know the degree with which these, if you have these drivers of disease, we don't really know the degree with which complement dysfunction contributes to final outcome. And so there is a huge knowledge gap about the degree of complement dysregulation or the role of comp complement in contributing to each of those feathers in the peacock or each of those circles shown here. As a result, the precise diagnostic tests that should be required and the differential diagnosis needs further scrutiny. And so highlighted as knowledge gaps were the role of Adam TS13 in young children and the role of hypertension and uh, preeclampsia and their relationship between these two conditions and hemolytic uremic syndrome. There were also knowledge gaps in terms of eculizumab. So all of you are on a standard dose of eculizumab. It's not individualized. Many of you have so much eculizumab on board that you're peeing it out. That's an expensive drug to be uh, peeing out. And, and the dose could be individualized and, and more personalized. So in our experience with a patient taken off eculizumab, it wasn't until that person was off it for two months that the level of eculizumab in the circulation dropped below a, th a, a therapeutic level. And so there's a, a, a publication that's just come out by Michael Kirchfink's group looking at personalized therapy with eculizumab and also looking at biomarkers that predict an effective dose of eculizumab, which is something that I had alluded to earlier that we can, that we can do. Um, and another example is, is whether to taper or versus stopping treatment, and I know I've, I've talked to somebody during break about methods by which you could, for example, taper the interval between, increase the interval between your doses of eculizumab if you were considering withdrawal of eculizumab if you didn't have factor H or MCP mutations, and how you could rationally do that, for example, by following complement biomarkers and seeing what happens after three months when you've increased the interval to three weeks or then you increase it to four weeks and then check your complement biomarkers after a three month period of time. Is atypical HUS a recurrent acute disease or a chronic disease? So what I mean by that is, is recurrent acute is you have a flare of disease and then after the flare, you're back to your baseline and your baseline's normal. It's like you get a cold, you're really sick while you have a cold, your cold goes away, you're back 100%, four months later you get another cold, so that's recurrent acute as opposed to chronic. So you have a flare and then your disease subsides and you become, you're well again, but you're not 100% well. In other words, you have subclinical ongoing disease. And there's, uh, we, we generally think of atypical HUS as recurrent acute and we generally think of C3 glomerulopathies as chronic and smoldering. But we have evidence that that's not really true. And so there are some persons in whom we know that atypical HUS is a chronic smoldering disease. And it's kind of um, ongoing, but the level of dysregulation is very, very low. 
uh, Carla talked about this a little bit about the extra renal manifestations and the bottom line is we don't really know anything about the long-term extra renal manifestations simply because until eculizumab it wasn't really possible to consider that question. So all persons on eculizumab who are doing really really well have actually changed the clinical paradigm because you're asking about extra renal manifestations and we, we, we didn't have a cohort of persons to study and answer that question. And then if, if, if uh, eculizumab withdrawal is contemplated, what should you follow and how should you follow that? And Carla commented on that. And then this study that has just come out in C. Jason by Fadi Fakuri. So this is the, the French group. And so this is the study that Carla alluded to. And the bottom line in that study was of 8 of 11 patients with factor H mutations relapsed, 4 of 8 with MCP mutations relapsed, none <coughs> negative for complement mutations relapsed. And there were 16 patients and their follow-up was 17 months. So that, that's relevant to you if you're considering potentially uh, increasing the interval between doses or discontinuing eculizumab. And so as a, a patient, it's relevant to you to have as much information as possible about the genetics of the disease, about the complement biomarkers that, are, that we can test on the disease, basically about what's going on and what drove your kidney failure in the uh, initially. Genetic drivers of disease. So the important thing about genetic drivers of disease is, is what uh, Nico said. Genetic testing is important, but it does not in any way affect the initial treatment of persons who present with atypical HUS. It is, however, informative in what to do as you travel down this road and, and um, consider possible therapies and treatments that you might undergo. When you get genetic testing, and so this is something that most patients and healthcare users don't really think about. You have to get the testing done at a lab that's competent in doing the testing, but also in a laboratory, by a lab, that actually looks at all the nuances associated with testing. And so it's not, it's not uh, satisfactory just to say, well, I've had complement testing done. You really need to know, or your physician should know, that the lab that did that testing looked at, for example, genetic rearrangements. So, so some areas that we look at are exceedingly difficult to study. And if things are exceedingly difficult to study, a lot of times routine clinical labs won't do that. They do the stuff that's eas more easily automatable and more easy to, to do. And so one example is um, this area, MLPA or next-gen sequencing, over areas that have high sequence homology. And so I know that some of you um, are, uh, have genetic changes that are associated with the development of novel fusion, fusion genes. So you're kind of one-off. So you already have an ultra-rare disease and you have an ultra-ultra-rare cause of that ultra-rare disease. And being able to identify that and pinpoint that is important. And then Nico talked about this. Um, this doesn't impact you so much. It, it really impacts the healthcare provider, the person who you receive your healthcare from. The diagnostic laboratory, whether it's MORL or another laboratory, has to generate a report that can be understood by a clinician and that the clinician can use to help the patients they're taking care of. And then disease penetrance. So this is huge. So if, if you have a variant that causes 
your atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, and you inherited that variant from one of your parents, and they've been well their whole yes. life, and they inherited it from one of their parents, and so that child's grandparents have been well their whole life. How come? I mean, how come? What, what's different living today versus living 30 years ago or 60 years ago? What is it that we're missing? And so I go back to the puzzle, and we think we're missing something. We think that maybe one of those things that we're missing is that crosstalk that I talked to you about when we talked about the coagulation system and the complement system, and Boo will talk about that briefly. So why is that important? Well, that's hugely important because if we can figure out what we're missing, and you have somebody who's diagnosed with atypical HUS, and we can figure out what we're missing, maybe we can make that person a little bit more like their parent or their grandparent, and then change the scale of the risk for them to have a relapse or recurrent disease. You're avoiding that right now by taking eculizumab, but is that the only answer? I'm guessing that it isn't, and I'm guessing that two years, four years down the road, there'll be options for you. But those options, I'm also guessing, will be predicated on really understanding what's driving your disease at a personal level. What is exactly going on in you at the genetic level and at the complement level. And that's kind of what that was about. And then does failure to identify a genetic cause Oh, so this, uh, this point gets back again to the peacock. And so if you have a variation in a complement gene, then you're the body of the peacock. If we didn't find anything that is significant in, in your genetic testing and it was done properly, and there's no complement driver of disease, then you're one of the feathers. And we ought to try and figure out which feather you are, because by figuring that out, you have a better understanding of what's driving or what has uh, is driving your disease. And then acquired drivers of disease, Carla went over that. We screen for factor H autoantibodies and in patients in whom that is not ordered, if we identify a genetic profile that's consistent with that as a possibility, we recommend to the clinician that that test be done. And then treatment strategies and Carla's um, talked about that. There is no justification. The evidence that justifies long-term therapy is, um, there isn't any really. It's, it's, and, so, and so that's in part the importance of the study that the French have just published. And Carla also talked about this. So the therapy in patients who have anti-factor H autoantibodies. And so, again, there were about 50 clinicians from around the world who attended this meeting. And the bottom line was um, the playing field for patients with atypical HUS has changed dramatically with eculizumab. But what it's really done, while eculizumab is a miracle drug and it's, and it's um, helped an enormous number of people. It's also allowed us to understand the disease in a different way, to raise different questions, and to now talk about, instead of considering you all as a group of persons with atypical HUS, look at each of you individually and ask what's best for you as an individual patient. And I think that that's, that was one of the take home messages for this. Linda, do you want to add anything? If we could just go back to that slide, two slides before. Um, I think that one of the things that um, I really appreciate with all the global partnerships um, are the doctors all over the world. Um, and Carla Nestor was there, and also Dr. Smith was there. So I think that speaks very highly for the Iowa team. But it was the 
idea that going together as a global community to share information, to share data, to look at the pharmacoeconomics, which is a fancy word for cost and access for patients all over the world. I think these are some key issues that concern us all as patients and family members and caregivers. Um, but it was very heartening to see a very uh, lively discussion um, on these topics by world-renowned um, researchers, clinicians, and geneticists from all over the world. I, I think that it's great to hear that all nations are working together. And I think part of that um, today, if you could just stand up for a second or wave, whichever you're comfortable with. We have a pediatric nephrologist from Japan. So if you could wave or stand up. <laughs> Thank you.